screen now. Our first speaker is Mr. John D. McDonald. McDonald. He has 47 years of experience in the electric utility transmission and distribution industry. John received his BS, EE, and MSWE power engineering degrees from Purdue University and an MBA degree from University of California, Berkeley. John is past president of IEEE PES, the VP of for technical activities for the US National Committee of CIGRE, the past chair of IEEE PES Substations Committee and the Division 7 direct past director. John was on the board of governors of the IEEE SA and is an IEEE Foundation director. Mr. John D. McDonald was awarded the IEEE Millennium Medal the IEEE Power and Energy Society Excellence in Power Distribution Engineering Award, the IEEE PES Substation Subcommittee Distinguished Service Award, the IEEE PES Meritorious Service Award, the 2016 CIGRE Distinguished Member Award, the 2016 CIGRE USNC Atwood Associate Award, and the 2021 CIGRE Honorary Member Award. John received the 2009 Outstanding Electrical and Computer Engineer Award from Purdue University. Mr. John D. McDonald teaches a smart grid course at the Georgia Institute of Technology, a smart grid course for GE and smart grid courses for various IEEE PES local chapters as an IEEE PES distinguished lecturer. John has published 150 papers and articles and has co-authored five books and has one US patent. Now currently smart grid business development leader, uh, GE's grid solution, Georgia USA. So it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome um, Mr. John D. McDonald on stage and he's joining us right now. Good morning, John. Good, yeah, good morning for me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good evening for uh, everyone in India. Good to see you. That's wonderful. Um, so I think um, uh, I think you're joining from Atlanta, right? Atlanta. I've been to Atlanta in 2019. It's 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 a quite an amazing place. I've explored all those places for around some seven days, and um, it was it was a wonderful experience. And hope things are safe there. Well, it's uh, you know we have to be careful still, right? With uh, with COVID. So, um, but this is a holiday weekend in the United States, and so. Um, we're hoping that when if people get together with other people that uh, if they stay stay careful so we can um, so things don't get worse you know so uh, so we can open things up uh, much faster in the future yeah yeah hopefully yeah and it's also been a long time that we have seen people gathering for conferences last week we had an opportunity to hear you uh, virtually but I'm also looking forward to those experiences that we can. Uh, hear you in person, right? And people can get together and do activities. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Cool. I think we have people joining on the call and then they're saying thank you. Thank you, Shay Ramana Renan, for joining us on the call. And um, John, you could also do this thing. Um, so I also, I made the first video on Tamil, right? My, our regional language. And that's a, a greeting in Tamil that says Vanakkam. Okay, so I, I, <laughs> I wanted you to do that for the people who are joining now also will be watching on live. So this, you can pronounce it as Banakkam. Do you want to try that and do this? Uh, namaste, yeah, Banakkam, it's called in Tamil. Like this? Yeah. Yeah. And do you want to come? Try saying Banakkam. Banakkam? Banakkam, that's wonderful. <laughs> thank you, thank you for trying to do that. So that's how we greet people um, back here, right? Okay. So, so wonderful, uh, wonderful, wonderful having you. So I'm going to, um, so I have planned this session in a, uh, like a very casual interaction, right? Um, I think people have heard you so much during a webinar and they have learned so many things technologically from you, but we will keep this session um, like a really, um, like, a, like an interview and I have a few questions to ask from you, a few pressing questions that I have sourced uh, both from my own learnings and also from the, the comments from the YouTube video which I have posted, which has got some uh, 1K plus views last week, right? And we also have a few people on um, on the call with us live. They can also post the question. So that's how it is planned. So Sri Ramanarayan and others who joined on the call, please feel free to post any questions that you have anytime, right? So that um, so that uh, we make it interactive. Yeah. So I'll get started with the first question uh, for you, John. So. Um, I was very much interested to know 
um the us energy department and the european task force right both of them they have termed the for the first ever first ever time they called this technology as smart grids in 2007 right that's the first time they have termed this technology uh into the um i mean as smart grids wanted to know your association with the technology and how would you define the technology for uh someone who's learning about it for the first time from your vast years of experience No, that's very uh, correct. In 2007, in the United States, we had the Energy Policy and Security Act, um, and uh, Energy Independence and Security Act (ESA). And uh, Title 13 of that legislation defined what the U.S. should do in smart grid, and that's where the, you're right. The smart grid term came from. Now, for, you know, smart grid is really adding intelligence to the grid. you know more automation more communications more connectivity more analytics doing things more economically more efficiently and um i've been working 47 years and all 47 years have been adding intelligence to the grid so i many of us uh senior people like me said what do you mean smart grid shouldn't isn't new we've been doing this for a long time so i i prefer smart er grid smart er Okay, and I have a PowerPoint slide in all my talks, and I I say this is smart grid. This is what we've been doing for a long time, the old grid, and this is the smarter grid, and these are the newer things we're doing since 2007. So I think it's important to to recognize we've been adding intelligence to the grid for a long time, but we're doing many many new things since since 2007. Okay, so you're saying like after 2007, it has become much more, uh, I think, smarter, right? Yeah, it's become it's become smarter, and it's become smarter faster, faster, because yeah. technology is changing much more quickly. Also, um, with two in 2009, we had the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, and mm -hmm. that that offered four and a half billion dollars in the United States. Of stimulus funding to do smart grid projects. I know India had had a stimulus program. Many countries did at the same time. What happened was we had many more smart grid projects being implemented, being deployed. So the smarter grid, you know, the the deployment of smart grid technology was much faster, was accelerated after 2009, actually, with the stimulus funding. Get it, get it. So. Whenever that they actually invent something new, it's also important that sufficient funding is required towards doing that research, and um, and yeah, bringing more research into the specific fields. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. I thought uh, in 2007 that's when they have started, so they only coined the term. That's so that's what I'm understanding. Thank you. Well, here, here's here's what happens. Two, the legislators make make rules in 2007, but mm -hmm. there's no money associated with it. There's no yeah, money, yes. and until there's money. As you said, very little is going to be done, right? Because you need you need the funding, and then the funding occurred in two thousand nine, and that's when that's when the smarter grid really uh, took off. That's when it really started. Yep. Makes sense. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. I think uh, one of those interesting questions which came uh, quite in a while was. How do they design uh, the smart grids? Right? How what? Like how does it really begin? the process um we know like the process of getting the power starts from like um i mean getting that power production right and then comes into different places but how do we when we want to design smart grids how do we go about it what would be the steps potential steps towards doing it now, that's a good question and and um uh, i i would say there's there's two two big steps okay the first step is and 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 we all we did this you know i work for ge So many of us in, in electric utilities, we all did this. We said in 2009, there's good, you know, there's four and a half billion dollars to do projects. What, 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 do, what does smart grid mean? What, you know, what do we need to do at our utility, or what do we need to do as a vendor? And the question was, we have a lot of technology components, but how do we put these together into integrated solutions? That would have value to the customer. Okay, we can put technology together many ways, 
but what's important is what has value to the customer. What what will the customer buy? So we we actually in 2000 in that time frame we came up with six holistic solutions that had the strongest business cases for electric utilities. It's asset optimization, demand optimization, distribution optimization, transmission optimization, smart metering and two-way communications, and workforce and engineering design optimization. For us, those were the six important holistic solutions for smart grid, okay? that Now, think about it. Smart grid goes from turbine to toaster, turbine to toaster. The landscape of smart grid is from the power plant, the turbine, into your home, the toaster. You know, generation, transmission, distribution, and the end use customer. So it's a very big landscape. So smart grid, you can you can get lost in smart grid because it's so big. So you have to you have to say what is important to the customer. And that's what we did with six solutions. The second step though is realizing before a customer buys anything new, they need to make sure they have a strong grid before a smart grid. Okay, this is important. Strong grid before smart grids. And strong grid is, is a, a robust communications infrastructure and a IT infrastructure to support enterprise data management. So what we make sure that we look at communications and the IT infrastructure before we start adding these uh, holistic solutions to make sure that uh, the electric utility will realize all the full benefits of anything that they add new. That's that's really helpful. Thank you. I think uh, it's also important to understand about the strong grids, right? Um, we need a very strong systems in place before we start doing anything. And um, I think that thank you for the edit. That's wonderful, Sid. So there was another question around how to find out smart grid fault detection, right? Um, and what can be done to avoid power failure? We've been implementing many of these technologies, but you've seen, um, I mean, in many places, right? Um, across the world, power failure has been a huge, huge uh, thing, especially for people to uh, face, right? In in the in this fast-paced world, everything happens because of power. So, how do we how do we understand? So, what's the difference between smart grid fault detection and also uh, how to avoid power failure? If we could cover that, that would be really helpful. Well, fault, fault detection, um, you know, um, if we look at the distribution system, the distribution part of the grid, which is when we talk about fault detection, we're usually talking about distribution, is, um, is we, you know, we have logic today that we can add to the distribution system, and it can either be in the control center on the distribution management system, or it can be in the substation level. But it, it's called fault detection, isolation, restoration, FDIR, or sometimes it's called fault location, isolation, service restoration, FLISR, F-L-I-S-R. And what, what we can do is we can um, automatically detect the fault right away, locate the fault, isolate the fault, and restore service upstream and downstream of the faulted segment the isolated faulted segment all within a minute or two. Okay. And that's, that's very important. And we can do this with no human in the loop, closed loop. So what we do is we install the logic in permissive mode first. So it's tested and we, we have confidence that the logic is doing the right thing. And then we close the loop on the logic and we can take the human out of the loop. And, um, and that's how we get a resilient, grid, or sometimes we call it a self-healing grid, a grid that can heal itself with no, no human involved. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think, yeah, self -healing, yeah that makes sense. And there was also a comment from uh, Sri Ramanarayanan saying like, SD and the software-defined networks could realize the IP comms. That's also wonderful. I think, uh, good thought. How software, I think we were also exploring this the last week, right? You're doing a talk, you were talking about how softwares could potentially support. Um, thank you for sharing that. Right. And and yeah, uh, uh, participants who are joining on the call, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to post. I think we have very less numbers this time. So any questions would be uh, would be taken by John and will be addressed by him. So, 
So yeah, uh, my next question is, um, it's like, John, we know this technology is rapidly growing, right? And there's been huge conversations, especially after the sustainability thing, uh, there's so many things around it. What do you think is the future of technology? Also asking this because if someone is very curious about this field of electrical and electronics engineering or in general technology, why should someone pursue smart grids, right? Why should someone want to learn more about this technology? I think, uh, to me, I think it's one of the most exciting times in, in my career. You know, I've been, I've been involved in IEEE for 50 years now, 50 years as a member, been working full time 47 years. And uh, people ask me when I'm going to retire. And I say, why would I retire? Uh, there's more fun right now than, than ever. So this is really an ideal time for a student and a young professional to be in the power and energy field. One of the things that, um, that we're just starting to learn about and apply is the journey to digital transformation. Um, you know, the goal of utilities today is a fully digitized grid. And this is, um, this is what, we get, what we talk about with big data, with new analytics, the internet of things, um, the user experience as opposed to the user interface, and also the application of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the concept of the digital twin. So I would say today, if, if I was a, a student or young person, the ideal combination today is to have expertise, academic experience with, with data science, coupled with power system domain knowledge. We, we hire a lot of data scientists today, but we have to teach them about the power system. Okay, they're, they're pure data scientists. And uh, we, we finished a book. I have five books that I've done. And one of the books is, is Big Data Application in Power Systems. And I wrote the first chapter of the book called A Holistic Approach to Becoming a Data-Driven Utility. Every, all the decisions today are, are driven by data. Okay. And that's why all the companies are hiring data scientists. But the data scientists don't know the power system. We have to teach them the power system. So one, one aspect of this is if a student has, you know, experience, knowledge, both in data science and the power system, that's a very unique combination today that com companies are looking for. So that's one aspect is we, we moved with maintenance and with, um, you know, assets like transformers and circuit breakers. We moved from reactive maintenance where we waited for something to fail and then we reacted, okay? But but the failure already occurred. We said, that's crazy. Why do we wait for something to fail? Let's be smart and let's say, what health information do we need from the asset? How do we analyze that health information? And let's predict a possible failure before it occurs, okay? And let's prevent the failure. So we've moved from reactive to predictive but that's only halfway in the journey of digital transformation. Eventually, we want to be autonomous. And autonomous is much more artificial intelligence, much more machine learning, and much more use of the digital twin. This is really, this is really exciting. And this is one of, one of the things with new technology that we're doing today. I think, yeah, I think um, the way you told about um, being reactive and to like being like, solving those things at a, at a proactive level, right? Do not allowing things to happen. There's also so much of exploration done on every field about this, right? Understanding false. Initially, we try to invent something. Also with human, um, I would say, psychology, there's so much of, uh, uh, I mean, talks. I mean, there's so much of connections between me not being reactive and then you have to be proactive and doing the things that you want, right? Um, I think I'd also apply to technology. I was able to make that connection uh, pretty well. So let me add, you, you brought up a good point. When I was an undergraduate electrical engineering student, I had six elective, six electives I could choose myself, right? In addition to the electrical engineering courses. And, and two of the six electives I took were psychology, psychology courses, okay? And, and I tell you, it, it's helped me a lot because um, for a young person, you think, the tech, you think learning the technology at the university is difficult? That's the easy part. 
when you start working for a company, you can develop a new product. The hardest thing is convincing a customer, a per people, convincing people to buy your new technology, which means that they'll have to do something different in a different way at their company, right? New technology means you're doing something different. And even though the benefits are, are obvious and the benefits are strong, people resist change. People resist change. And so psychology is very helpful because you could develop the best technology in the world, but never sell it because you don't understand how to convince people to do something different and buy new technology. Okay, so psychology, you raised a good point. I think psychology should be required. Psychology courses should be required for all engineering students. <laughs> that's that's so very true. I think when we were talking about smart grids, you are mentioning about um, like so many different people coming together, right? Um, and it's also important that people who are working, um, I mean, people who have mastery on people psychology is also something that's needed. And it's also very interesting to know that you picked up that uh, elective subject when you are in masters. That's that's so very nice. Okay. And by the way, we are also inviting a psychologist on one of those Edu Rice shows on the next few weeks. So, so I thought, uh, I think it's also a nice time to understand for even for engineers, psychologists, uh, psychology is much more important. That's wonderful. Cool. Um, my next question to you um, is in terms of the resources available to learn more about smart grids. You have authored so many wonderful books, right? Uh, I just wanted to know in case if someone has known about this technology, they don't know basics, but they want to gain some advanced proficiency. What, what are the courses you would recommend or what are the books you would ask them to read or what are the uh, workshops or projects? I mean, of course, they would do things at hands on. But to get to that level, what would be those things that would be helpful for people? I would I would say two two things, two things in general. OK, one one is um, one. Is, well, both are actually very easy. One is um, there's a lot of online material with respect to smart grid. For instance, um, if you if you search on the internet with my name and um, smart grid, or my name and IEEE PES, or my name and IEEE smart grid, um, you know, you'll, you'll, um, you'll find a lot of webinars and a lot of online courses that uh, I've done either by myself or with with uh, one other person. And uh, in some cases, these are online and they're free on the IEEE PES Resource Center, uh, or they may be, there may be a small charge, okay? Uh, so I, I have material with IEEE PES, Power and Energy Society, with IEEE Smart Grid, and with IEEE Educational Activities. And with IEEE Educational Activities, uh, I have four one-hour sessions on four different parts of Smart Grid that are all professionally done, professional graphics, and actually a professional narrator that uh, used the scripts that I wrote. So these are very, very nice, nice courses. And they're uh, about one hour in length. We have tutorials that are available a one-day tutorial on uh, advanced distribution management systems and distribution automation that's available from IEEE PES that uh, another person and I did. So I think there's there's a lot of good online material that's either free or, or a small, very small cost, okay? And then the other thing is with respect to books, um, just to give you some examples, of the five books that I've co-authored, the best reference on Smart Grid is a book on Smart Grid um, that is in its second edition. It's over 800 pages and it's very comprehensive. It's 25 chapters. I wrote the last chapter of the book on the future of Smart Grid, but it's uh, just published a couple of years ago. And, you know, I said Smart Grid is from turbine to toaster. So it's a very big landscape. Well, in this book, in the 25 chapters, we cover every part of Smart Grid, uh, and, and it's global. It's not just technology, but it's standards, it's policy, uh, 
you know, it it's very comprehensive. Uh, another book is Electric Power Substations Engineering. It's in its third edition, very widely used practical reference book, 22 chapters on, on substations. Uh, a third book is Power System SCADA and Smart Grid that, I, uh, that was published in 2015. So, you know, uh, an important part of Smart Grid is the, the SCADA system, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition, that do all the control of generation, transmission, and distribution. If it's generation transmission, it's an EMS, energy management system. If it's a SCADA system for distribution, it's a distribution management system or advanced distribution management system, ADMS or DMS. Um, and that book I co-authored with Professor Minnie Thomas, who a uh, professor at Jamia Milli Islami University in New Delhi. And she's now the director of the NIT in Trichy. For, for the for a five year assignment, so she a uh, very close friend of mine, and we spent over two years and wrote that book on SCADA. So these are some some good references um, and some good online material that's re readily available. Okay. So while you were um, thank you for sharing that, John. So while while you were actually um, talking about like searching about your name, right? I was just doing a search. I will I'll show it on the screen. There's so much of resources, right? Um, you yeah. have contributed so much of resources towards this technology. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. I think also the books that you shared uh, with me over email was also very helpful. In case if anyone requests that, please post uh, post your email IDs on uh, the chat box of this video. We would be able to share, um, yeah, those resources which are available for free with you. And and yeah, thank you uh, for sharing that. That's wonderful. Okay, so. My final question, I just want to move away from technology a bit, technology field a bit. And I think you have been a veteran volunteer, I think. Uh, so people on the call, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to post. Uh, I just, I'm just curious about this specific question. Whenever I look at someone who is contributing very actively when they are, um, when they are, have so much of experience, right? The way I look at it is there's something that drives you, right? And what I've always seen is when you are a youngster, you always have some uh, like to aspire to grow, there's some motivation for you, but how do you really stay motivated? You've been doing so much of talk, so much of work, and I genuinely wanted to know that and this will also help so many people. So, so yeah, what keeps you motivated and how do you grow also in terms of, especially after um, you cross that level, right? You crossed your degrees, um, you started working, and then how do you keep that motivation of contributing, doing so many things? Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I think, first of all, you really have to like what you do, okay? If, if, if your job is one where in your mind you think that, oh, I, I get up in the morning and I have to go to work and I'm, not, and I'm not looking forward to it, then I think you have the wrong job, you know, because you, you don't enjoy what you do. You, you, really, you really want to have a passion and really enjoy the work that you do and also the people you work with, okay? And so that that's something that um, I've always, I'm all, you know, you wanna be happy all the time, you wanna be positive. I think the other thing too is you can't, you don't wanna structure your life where you're working all the time, okay? You need to have a very good work-life balance. And one thing that's important to me, you can see behind me uh, over here, a lot of ribbons. Those are all 5K races. I started running races when I, when I was 60 years old, 59 years, no, 60 years old, started running races. I'll be 70 years old in December. And I, uh, I work out with a trainer five mornings a week in a very intense boot camp. And uh, I used to run many, many races and I'm very competitive. I wanna win everything that I do. And I won many of these races in my age group, okay? So you wanna have, you wanna be healthy. You wanna get enough sleep. You wanna eat healthy. You wanna exercise regularly. And um, you're, if you exercise regularly, it helps you with your work. Your, your mind is clear, uh, the stress is gone. And, and you're much more effective with your work. So you really want to have a passion for everything you do. And I find 
when I build a team of people to help me, to help me like with I to do something, I look for the busiest people I can find. The busiest, not the least busy, but the busiest people. The busiest people are the ones that love what they do. They love doing a lot of things at the same time. They're very dependable. They do very, very good work. They, they, they get things done on time and they love what they do, you know? And so I always build a team. I look for the busiest people. In IEEE or in any volunteer organization, when I have something very critical that has to be done on my team, I, I ask the busiest person on my team to do it, okay? So let me just say, um, I'll offer two things. I, I have a webinar that I did for IEEE PES that is it's free. And um, it's on the IEEE PS Resource Center. And I reviewed my 47 year career and there were 12 key decisions I made that impacted the rest of my career, okay? And in one hour, I review these 12 key decisions. It's called Key Insights to Career Management. And I, I would recommend every student and every young person to spend one hour and, and go through my webinar. It's a very fun, I use a lot of family photos, uh, industry photos to talk about these 12 key points. Because see, if you, if you know all these 12 key points when you're young, you can do a much better job of managing your career. I didn't know many of these until I was much older, okay? And then the second thing is, and I, I give this talk quite a bit for students and young professionals, is how to build and lead a voluntary organization. You know, it's, it's very, it's challenging to lead people that are volunteers because they're not getting paid by the organization. And I, over, in 50 years of IEEE leadership positions I've had, 50 years as a member, I've learned a lot of techniques on how to effectively engage with people. And how do you, how do you encourage people to do things that you want them to do as a volunteer? So uh, that's another talk that I give. It's, it's, it hasn't been recorded yet, but I'm, I, um, I've been giving it for, you know, student groups and, and, all, all over the world, and I'm, I'm happy to do that uh, all the time. So these, these are some of the things that I, I encourage, you know, have a passion for what you do, uh, manage, you know, take an interest in your career when you're, when you're young. Uh, and oh, the last thing would be find at least one mentor. Mentoring is extremely important. Think, think about the work that we do in industry is an art. It's not a science. The science is what you learn at the university. That's what's in the books. But when you get out and start working full time, you have to learn how to apply the science in the real world. And there's no books for that. You have to spend years with experienced people and that learn how learn the art. Okay. And that's why mentoring is so important. Find at least one or two experienced people and spend time with them on a regular basis and learn the art, learn the art of electrical engineering, learn the art of what we do and your career. You're, you'll be much more valuable in your career and you'll have a, you'll, you'll, you'll love what you do because you'll be very good at it. And uh, you'll, and you'll be providing value to people and value to the company you work for. Okay. I think that's, that's so beautifully put, especially the points you told about, uh, your own experiences with those uh, races, right? I used to follow, I mean, follow your LinkedIn posts. So yes. much of inspiration that you provide. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go off the screen just to show the medals, uh, the number of medals and <laughs> the number of things you were able to do, right? That's yes. quite awesome. That's that's a lot in numbers. Thank you. Thank you for that. And and also, I have I have made a personal connection, especially when you said around um the point around when you're busy you get so much of tasks right when you are idle there's there's nothing that's happening for you so i was able to make the connection especially when you're busy when you start doing things i don't know whether it is um like in what way we start getting more and more work uh, maybe because 
people also choose to pick up people who are busy and then provide them more tasks that's also another way of looking at it so we have a question i think we could take one more question one question from the audience so this is from shri ramana rayan thank you for watching the full show so his question is musk is elon musk is basically revolutionizing what's your opinion on his take with smart grids um so that's the question so yeah i wanted to know your thoughts and opinions on elon musk as well i tell you um there there's there's many many people in the world that are are visionaries you know they have uh very good ideas for the future but many of them don't know how to how to make those ideas real in the real world you know how to actually build something how to how to effectively commercialize uh the vision the one thing with elon musk is elon musk not only has visionary ideas but he's a doer you know he figures out a way to make it happen right and i am you know what wh what's interesting to this question is uh my wife and i just bought a brand new tesla electric vehicle and um today is our one week anniversary of having our new electric vehicle so we we have a brand new tesla model 3 long range elon musk electric vehicle and it it's 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 so futuristic um the regenerative braking having all the controls all in software on a touch screen as opposed to you know dials there's no dashboard in the car everything is on the touch screen um it is a it is you know it is a blast to drive and it is it's quite a learning experience so i would say people like um branson like branson with virgin people like elon musk these people are not only visionaries but they make it happen and and those are the people you want to follow you know um the future is electric vehicles there's no question and the sooner all of us can experience an electric vehicle the better and i'll tell you what it is so different my wife my wife is 71 and i'll be 70 in december it is you know we've had cars for many many years driving a tesla is so different from driving all of our previous cars in a fun in a fun way though it's a real new learning experience and um we all need to to keep up with technology and people like Elon Musk people like Branson you know they're they're the visionaries and when they when they do something you you can't you can't you can't um avoid it you know you all we all you can't just look at a, you can't just go online and view te tesla car videos i mean we did that before we got our car to anticipate what it would be like that's not enough you have to actually be in, you have to actually drive the car to truly learn the differences with a with a tesla car you have you can't just watch videos you actually have to experience it and that's what i i really recommend people like musk with a power wall energy storage with the electric vehicle you know take advantage of that and experience it because you have to keep up with technology and keep that's that's what the future is these are the people that are driving the future in a real way so i, I really uh i'm a good example of of somebody almost 70 years old that just bought a tesla vehicle and uh for the first time and love love the experience <laughs> <laughs> that's very nice congratulations on the uh, first week's anniversary so that's wonderful uh, glad to know and also your thoughts about like how uh, we should also be a uh, uh, i mean bring our whatever ideas that we have into a commercial success right that's the true essence of being a um, building a business or being an entrepreneur is all about thank you so so much for sharing um i think yeah, after no further questions i would uh, would like to say a big 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 thank you for taking your time and then doing this session um, like um, we will have this recording forever on youtube right it's going to be there on youtube all the time and you have kick started this we wanted to do a lot more edurise shows like getting experienced people on board and then hearing out their experiences and you are the person who uh, who has provided that spark towards starting this thank you so much when i reached out to you uh, on an email you were very quickly accepting this 
and that shows your kindness and support uh, for all the people. Thank you so so much, John. And as as we close out, as I told you, when I come in the beginning, we also say nandri uh, to to thank people in our local language in Tamil. So I'm going to say nandri. <laughs> thank you for uh, taking your time and uh, have a great day. And we look forward to welcoming you in India sometime soon. And we'll we'll go we'll take you to a lot of places here in here there and show you show you here. Hopefully the COVID things will come down soon. Yeah. I'm looking forward to. I I actually have family in India. So my my son married a beautiful girl from Mumbai. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I have family in India, and um, I love. I've been to India many times to teach, teach courses and give talks. And um, uh, you know, I I uh, my favorite food is alu alu paratha. I love. Wow. Okay. <laughs> alu paratha, and um, so I'm looking forward to. Being able to get back to India and, and um, visit Mumbai to see uh, my, you know, family, and um, I've never been to Chennai, so that's one. I have, I now have a lot of friends in Chennai from all the the webinars and talks I've given uh, with several, you know, with St. Joseph's and uh, PIT. So I'd, I, um, anyway, I, I, uh, I've made a lot of new friends in India that I want to visit when when I'm able to. Definitely, definitely. We would love to host you, and and yeah, Chennai is a beautiful place as well. It's like similar to how Mumbai is the um, like the capital, the the, the the city of total business and all the commercial, right? It's like the commercial capital of India. So Chennai is the cultural capital. So we have so much of um, like temples, all these uh, amazing places where you can visit and you can um, like have a. Have a good time, yeah. So, John, thank you, thank you so so much. Thank you so much from the bottom of my, of my heart, and um, have a great day. Have a great day. Have a great day. All right. Thank, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.